Welcome to the latest installment of the AST Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club features the article, Machine Learning-Based Prediction of Health Outcomes in Pediatric Organ Transplantation Recipients. This session is hosted by AST's Psychosocial and Ethics Community of Practice and the Pediatrics Community of Practice. In a moment, I will turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Ashley Spann from Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Before we begin the main presentation, we do have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available on the MyST website two to three business days after the live session. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard clearly for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the Journal Club, we encourage you to participate using the Q&A button in the Zoom webinar panel. Questions submitted via the chat window may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the Journal Club. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's session, you will see a link to a short evaluation survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Spann, to begin our presentation. Thank you for that introduction. You know, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for attending the session today. I especially would like to thank AST as well for organizing this. Today we'll be discussing Dr. Killian's article on using machine learning for the prediction of health outcomes in patients under, who have undergone organ transplantation. Dr. Killian is an associate professor at the Florida State University College of Social Work, and he has a courtesy appointment as a professor in the FSU College of Medicine. He is also research faculty at Children's Medical Center of Dallas and is their solid organ transplant program. His primary research focus surrounds pediatric organ transplant recipients and their families, adherence to medication regimens, and post-transplant health-related quality of life and health outcomes. Today, we will be discussing machine learning as it is used in pediatric populations, but I think this will beg a broader discussion on how we can utilize machine learning in the management of patients who are undergoing transplantation across all spectrums. With that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Killian to discuss his article. All right. Well, first of all, I thank you for everybody for uh, attending and thank you for the invitation to present this research. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, <clears throat> and, you know, machine learning and this type of prediction modeling is a really valuable tool. And what I want to show you today is not only this paper, but the, the research that has um, been followed up with. And we have subsequent papers and projects and NIH funding. I can show you where this has gone and where, is, and where it's going. Um, first, I want to say that this, you know, talk about conflicts of interest and certainly not talking about any randomized control trial medication or device, but also uh, the research here and the relevant disclosure is that these were uh, funded both by uh, either through NIH or by NIH funds uh, uh, through the our joint CTSI between University of Florida and Florida State University. I was also supposed to say that uh, Dr. Spann also has no relevant uh, financial disclosures. And with that, I'm going to get started um, in talking about this article. Um, this was the, uh, you know, really the first chance that we had uh, to begin looking at machine-based learning and uh, artificial intelligence and its application in, in, in UNOS data in, among our collaboration. And so I wanted to point out, um, importantly, Dr. Zha He, who's uh, the, you know, the author here, uh, in his role in all of this. Uh, he was going to be here today, but um, had another presentation of some type that he couldn't attend. So I wanted to go through this and I'm happy to, to continue. Um, all of you know that there's an increasing wealth of information that we have um, that's da produced daily through our patient record systems and uh, electronic health records. And of course, I mean, the most popular one, and uh, we were just at... Um, the International uh, Society for Heart and Lung Transplant meeting. And I mean, numerous, numerous presentations are using UNOS data and looking at particular health risks or even beginning looking at you know, social health and social determinants of health risks uh, for any number of post-transplant outcomes and differences in patient populations 
and in, among adults and pediatrics. Um, you know that this is an, an important facet of the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm sure everybody knows this, but we took this as an excellent opportunity to see what utility there would be in using UNOS data, especially in pediatric populations, uh, to begin looking at um, if we can find some type of predictive modeling, uh, looking at um, rejection after transplantation and hospitalization. So in this first study, you know, we, we pulled all of the available data we had from Children's Medical Center of Dallas, or I guess I'm supposed to say a, um, a nameless large southwestern, you know, uh, you know, pediatric transplant center. But our what we wanted to look at first was that are there methodologies within machine learning that are able to leverage all of this available information from a large number of data sources? And, you know, I'm sure plenty of you are aware that you know, a lot of um, research into post-transplant health outcomes suffers from the same problems. And this even gets more exacerbated when you're looking at pediatric populations, which are, you know, a smaller sample size and often, uh, you know, smaller patient loads within individual centers. And trying to coordinate um, a large amount of data being collected from multiple centers is an administrative nightmare some days in terms of getting um, you know, patient electronic health records uh, extracted uh, in, and there's cost, pro, you know, it's cost prohibitive in some ways. Uh, some centers want you know, four to $10,000 to have their data extracted. And, and you know, sometimes there can be a lot of concerns with that. So a, a lot with the current um, research is that it suffers from small transplant centers and we have very small amount of utility and predictive utility from uh, biostatistical methods, like you know, looking at basic logistic regression models with small sample sizes, um, or looking at uh, survival analysis either through Kaplan-Meier or you know Cox regression. So there's there's been a lot of challenges uh, in trying to find what are these pre-transplant and early post-transplant factors that are going to play a role in predicting health outcomes. So this leads to you know, the idea that we should really begin looking at advanced machine learning approaches and in, in taking advantage of these types of um, statistical techniques. Um, the advantages are that they can identify unique patterns of risk uh, among um, these patients in various variables or you know, are they're called features in the model. But more importantly, that we sometimes can't get at through something like general linear modeling or other biostatistical approaches is that we can begin to explore complex relationships uh, among factors and seeing if that if one is risk factor or, or a value in a, within a risk factor begins to, um, you know, sort of tip the hand towards other risk factors, if it activates other features, you know. Um, and so that's something you'll find, and I'll, I'll talk about a few different types of machine learning models that we used. Um, but most importantly, as with all of you, I know you're here because it, it's it's not the prediction of risk that's important, but it's it's identifying high-risk patients and offering services or intervening or providing more support for uh, especially you know, patients, and we're talking about children, you know, uh, we certainly have families that factor into all of this. But a lot of this um, machine learning and predictive modeling, all of this is going towards creating a foundation for improved clinical care and understanding what if there's risk stratification and understanding which patients are high risk or, risk or low risk, even their families. And again, a lot of this goes to um, increasing decision making and providing uh, clinicians decision making tools. And you would hope, and I think the ultimate goal of this, and I'll show you, you know, over the course of the presentation, I hope is that th the goal is to get this in real time in front of um, uh, physicians and transplant teams and transplant nurses, social workers, and psychologists to understand in real time, is this a high risk patient for what you're currently seeing and provide good information to allow um, better decisions and supports to be provided. Uh, at the clinical level within that setting. So when we first did this study, um, of course, we wanted to pilot this process and looking at UNOS data from you know, a large transplant center, but 
Um, if anyone here who's worked with UNOS data should know, it is a downright mess. Um, the, the data has changed over the years. There's variables that have come in and gone out. They've uh, sometimes like on, what is it? The uh, functional status of patients, they've changed the coding over the years. Uh, my personal bone to pick with UNOS is that they had one uh, question on medication adherence, or they called it, they, they still call it compliance. But they, I think they decided, or somebody did, that that wasn't a great way to assess uh, medication adherence. And so it's, instead of refining the variable, they just went ahead and uh, removed it. So it's no longer collected. I think it was last collected in 2004, which is, you know, so now we have no information on the medication adherence uh, of any patient nationwide that's in a, you know, this large of a data set. So we decided that understanding the UNOS data is this complex and this messy and requires a lot of cleaning, a lot of, you know, I, I jokingly say custodial work uh, in, in the front end of this. Uh, we decided that we were gonna pilot this process with a large transplant center. And we chose uh, kidney, liver and heart transplantation uh, as what was available at the clinic or at the center in course page uh, ages zero to 18. Um, we chose, in, in knowing this would be a bit messy, well, we chose to get all of the available data from the STAR files. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that idea, that these are the uniquely held and curated files that are accessible from UNOS for every individual center. And this was the data that we had from these years. Um, to control for the, the effect of ERA or, you know, changes over time, especially in, you know, that, that by decade, we actually put year of the transplant within the model to try to account for and control for the effect of ERA. Um, the machine modeling approaches that we, we chose here, for, at least for this initial uh, study that you saw in the article, and these were the approaches, everything from basic logistic regression over a large, you know, large number of variables and large data set through decision tree and random forests. Uh, but the unique thing that we started uh, here that hadn't been done before with pediatric data is looking at um, this multi-level uh, perceptron. What this is, is a, a step forward in machine learning where this is artificial network analysis. And this is a, a type of machine learning where uh, it's known as deep learning where it follows um, sort of an analogy or analogous to um, uh, how neurons connect within uh, the central nervous system. And so if there is an, one variable has a sufficient value, it may activate another variable as being suddenly um, uh, predictive where in other values of other variables, it wouldn't have been predictive. So this is the idea that you have uh, nodes and neurons and some values of some variables can activate other areas of the, of the uh, set of variables and in, in being um, important towards uh, prediction and increasing the you know, accuracy or, you know, some of you may know area under the curve as a, pre, you know, a predictive um, metric. We also did support vector uh, machine and it's a sequential optimization algorithm where the it takes prior iterations of the model and sees what other things and other variables and other values of variables it can add to the model to increase its predictive utility. So the big change with this and what hadn't been used in, in this type of data, even with UNOS data, even with adults, was the deep learning approach. And you can see that through these last, last two um, here. So, this was the real challenging piece is that we, we decided, well, you know, there has to be some type of model uh, evaluation and how are we going to, uh, you know, you know, try to figure out how many of these variables are usable in, uh, in the analyses. And so we broke down all of the data into 90% for training and then a 10% assessment for testing. We're using weighted area under the receiving operating characteristic curve or the rock curve. And looking at for the predictive results from machine learning and deep learning models. So, an important facet of this this article as well was that, and I'm sure it's I keep saying this a lot of you have I'm sure have read these articles and you can see that the models were successful, but you're not certain which variables were the most important or most salient in their prediction. And so, what we chose here to use, and I'll show you this in a subsequent 
uh, slide as well, is that these shapely additive explanation values or SHAP values. And what's important about these is they show the, you know, the actual predictive value of individual variables and can show you that the values as if they are increasing or decreasing for a variable, if they're more or less predictive relative to other variables. So it gives a hierarchy of um, how important uh, certain uh, variables within the UNOS data set are to the prediction of health outcomes here. Um, this was the original data cleaning process and, and looking at how we organize the data and how we organize the modeling. So you can see that we chose all of the wait list and the uh, TRF, that's the uh, transplant recipient form database. Uh, and so the, the wait list and transplant, that includes the what's known as the, what the TRR and the TCR forms from UNOS. That's the candidate form and the registration form, uh, such that it's the early pre-transplant and the uh, immediate transplant data, health and medical data from those times. And then the TRF is the transplant follow-up form. That's the one when completed annually. So when we looked at these and we tried to pull out all of the pediatric data, uh, remove those that had uh, prior transplants. So these are only the first transplants. But we also looked at um, merging all of these data sets and seeing if we couldn't find the pre-transplant observation window and predicting one-year, three-year, and five-year uh, outcomes. And this seems to be the standard um, approach across any number of machine learning models uh, and, 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 and studies across um, transplantation. We then uh, had a panel of machine, or um, sorry, medical experts who uh, looked at in trying to find what individuals thought were the most clinically relevant variables uh, across. But importantly, and this was because UNOS data, it can be really messy. If there were variables that had more than 50% missing, um, those were immediately dropped before we started uh, missing value analysis and imputation of missing data. And finally, we got to the process of actually conducting the analysis. What this chart represents here was months of work and, and bringing together the data, cleaning the data, writing the data for analysis, and then finally connect, conducting the analysis. So the total number of variables in all the data sets, just raw data alone, you can see is a pretty staggering amount of, of what's available. It includes all of the, again, the TRR and the TCR data forms from UNOS, but also the small amount of um, uh, annual data that we had from one, three, and five years for a patient. So once we got down, these were the final usable variables that we had in the UNOS data. Looking at, you know, and again, from early and then one, three, and five year um, in the heart transplant recipients. After we, we conducted the modeling, and the major uh, idea behind the paper was, again, looking at deep learning approaches, uh, the UNOS data wasn't very successful in predicting health outcomes using deep learning approaches. And we ended up that the best performing machine learning models were those like random forest, um, uh, and logistic regression models. And you can see that even then, these are still pretty um, you know, modest results. And, and looking at this from single center, uh, the single center data set. Um, the gray is the deep learning, which you know, at some point was, was no better than uh, you know, 0.5 accuracy or 50%. And our best outcomes that we had were in, um, were in later uh, years and also in heart transplant recipients, we had more success among the pediatric heart population in predicting. Um, so this is hard to see, and I admittedly, but this is what is in the the article, and it's uh, and and I can give a breakdown of these in a minute. But these are the SHAP values uh, ranked per variable, and so what you'll see in here are a lot of the usual medical um, variables, including. Uh, and, and of course, some of the most important ones are the functional status of the patient, which is you know a broad measure of um, if the organ is functioning or it's the uh, following transplantation or the on a scale of zero to one hundred and by you know um, 
intervals of 10 if the patient is, um, it's a health-related quality of life sort of metric. But within here too, we see, is there education participation? Uh, is there, um, you can see ethnicity being an important facet here. Along, here's gender within the liver transplant and heart transplant is this bottom row. But in here, you see, you, you can see that there are a number of not only medical, but social determinants of health uh, variables. And these are just the top, uh, I believe the top 15 or 20 variables per model uh, and showing that they're relative importance. Um, so you can see here that this study began to demonstrate that machine learning approaches can have some success with uh, moderate accuracy in predicting um, uh, rejection uh, or hospitalization due to rejection within the one and three five-year periods. Um, so that took us a step forward and decided that we would begin looking at now that we had you know, sort of formalized the process and, and had some success in cleaning the data and preparing it for analysis, we wanted to look for the one, three, and five-year post-transplant outcomes. And we opened it up to the national data set among all heart transplant recipients uh, within the national data. And this work led to, uh, and, and that idea led to uh, funding from NIH, from the National Library of Medicine, to look at these types of outcomes and we first um, are, we're beginning to look at, at, at uh, the national UNOS data so we can prepare for that for a future step. And I'll show you that in a minute. And that's why this says across transplant centers in Florida. So after that, the publication of that first um, study, uh, we just submitted, I think just minor revisions just this morning on another study uh, that looked at the national data but restricted the, the uh, organ type down to just heart transplant. Um, so once again, we grabbed the national data and started this process again, looking at machine learning, but also deep learning and neural network analysis approaches uh, and wanted to understand that could we get this just from one organ type and have better success of these approaches uh, across the national data. So much the same process, one, three, five year, looking at, you know, at the time of transplant, the, uh, at the time of listing, and then looking annually in the post-transplant follow-up data. With that, this was the national data and pa patient characteristics. So we had, you know, about 8,200 uh, kids, and these are their various, uh, this is mortality outcomes, and looking at differences, just ba basic um, bivariates uh, differences between these two groups in the overall data set. You can see that, you know, uh, uh, children who had unfortunately passed away were on average older, but that's a metric of time. Wasn't any significant differences by gender. You can see some racial and ethnic disparities here. Um, uh, prior cardiac surgery was a, was a major piece here. You can see the, the VAD uh, was also a major predictor of health outcomes. And also an important, we talked, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, the importance of controlling for the era effect. So once again, we looked at uh, year of transplant as an important uh, variable to include to help recognize that clinical care, medical care have all improved over time, and that has to be controlled for and included in any type of modeling. This is another way of, of showing, you know, that the same approach that we had last time, but looking at the pre-transplant and early post-transplant variables, and then looking at one, three, or five-year outcomes. And it's the uh, different chart, but same approach, and, and looking at rejection and mortality among, uh, you know, the national sample of pediatric heart transplant recipients. Different approach here, and, and, and we chose some different models here, and Again, we were using logistic regression and random forests, but then you can begin to see that we're, we're still using support vector machine. And then we chose uh, different types of what are called boost models. So extreme gradient boosting, which is where it, it, it is an iterative the process uh, where it begins looking at other variables to keep adding to the model. And it would do a tenfold process where it would have an original model 
and then would include what it learned from that model over a tenfold process, same with adaptive boosting. Um, much of these are what I explained earlier, including the neural network uh, type, or which you know is the deep learning approach within this multi-layer perceptron. But also we use this um, the SGD approach, which is looks at parameters and, and uh, operationalizes uh, and optimizes models by some type of gradient function, which is still the idea of it's an iterative process, which it's changing. Um, certain values of variables over time to optimize the model towards prediction. Uh, again, we use the same metrics and the same overall testing approach as looking at area under the curve and also then you know training with 90% of the data uh, and then testing with the additional 10%. So, um, with that, we also then added back the SHAP values because, again, the interpretation of these models is sometimes difficult. And I, I know as somebody who's, uh, you know, a biostatistician, I want to see what these variables are doing in the model. I don't want to be told that the model is successful without knowing which variables were the most salient. And so that's why the SHAP values are an important piece to in increase uh, interpretation and hopefully begin to... Um, you know, help with the implementation of results. And you can see the SHAP values there, uh, same same values as last time. Within rejection and mortality, these are were the successes that we had here. And you can see just among the heart transplant recipients nationally, um, you can see that the random forest model, which is yellow, was important for mortality and also had some early success in terms of um, re, you know, predicting hospitalization due to rejection. Another important piece was this, the AdaBoost, which was that optimization model. Uh, and what was the last one here was the, another uh, type of boost that we talked about, the XGB model. So again, you can see that these are getting better over time. There's better prediction over a five-year period than a one-year period in terms of early post-transplant outcomes. Uh, but also you can see that these, these models were are, are better performing than we did it with just centers uh, with single center data. This is the same kind of chart that you, I showed earlier. And here I think they're a little bit more clear. You can see that graph status is whether or not the organ was functioning immediately post-transplant. Uh, and you can see that um, uh, ventricle assist devices are important, number of days that the patient was status 1A. Um, you can see that prior cardiac surgeries were important, but also uh, age of the donor, age of the recipient, um, and ischemic time. There was other donor variables included in here as well. But again, as, as these go out, we saw that a lot of social uh, determinants of health began creeping up to be important variables, age, uh, age race, and ethnicity. Um, and so these were, sorry, these uh, those are all, um, sorry, those popped up at different times. But uh, a lot of the donor variables were important. Um, but also we saw that there was you know, pre-transplant and, and at time of transplant data that was pulled from the uh, transplant recipient forms. But here we can see that you know, there's, there's patient social factors. And, and again, another argument that I have with UNOS data is that it's very, very light on social determinants of health. We just don't have much information uh, about um, patients and their families or their family environment. Uh, the bad joke I always say is that uh, with this data or even looking back within patient records within a center, I can tell you a child's BMI on a Tuesday in January, but I can't tell you from the patient records and the, the, the structured form data that's easy to analyze and include in models, I can't tell you whether or not that, that family has two parents or it's a single mom working, two jobs. I can't tell you about uh, education level. I can't tell you if that kid was in school last week or has had other social difficulties or having peer problems or, you know, or other difficulties with medication adherence. These are the things that are not available in this data. So when I say social determinants of health, it's pretty thin uh, in, in this. Um, I mean, they have, I mean, uh, academic education, it's, it's level of um, participation 
and if they're at grade level. But that's a very, you know, simplistic look at the psychological and social, you know, health or well-being of the family and, and the patient we're talking about here, especially in pediatrics. So this goes towards a lot of the limitations in this type of modeling is that the UNOS data may, we may have exhausted its value in getting up to about 75%, maybe on a good day, accuracy towards modeling. And these models were better in the national data and only with heart transplants, um, it was better than our single study uh, uh, model performance. Um, one thing, and this was a large discussion within similar sessions at um, ISHLT, was that I'm, I wonder, and a lot of other attendees were wondering, if the UNOS data has a sort of, uh, for this type of approach, it's kind of exhausted its utility, if large administrative databases like this are, are not optimal for this type of prediction, or I would argue that it, the data is fine. We just don't have all of the variables we need to, to push this up to, you know, 0.8% or, you know, or 80% accuracy. There's a lot of lack of granularity when we're looking at annual follow-ups, and that doesn't include a lot of what's happened during the year. And if, certainly there's not a lot about the social determinants of health environmental factors, family factors, uh, we're talking kids and peers if they're teenagers. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges that I'm sure all of us have seen in a clinical setting that are not represented or collected in this data. Um, and I've already griped about this, but I, I, I find it uh, really frustrating that there is not a, um, a medication adherence variable even if bad, it would have been valued, uh, you know, in, in some of these analyses. So with, with our frustrations uh, with some of the UNOS data and looking at sometimes the, the challenges with only patient records, um, we've taken the next step, and that's what this grant from NIH was, uh, was helping us to do. We're actually going forward and looking at um, looking to extract social determinants of health and psychosocial factors from not the patient health record, but specifically from the unstructured clinical text. Anytime there's a progress note or an assessment or evaluation, pre-transplant psychosocial assessment, anytime there has been a meeting with uh, you know, a clinical or progress note with the psychologist or social worker or nurse, we're pulling that information forward and looking at um, these other rich sources of psychosocial data. And I, I guess I, I got ahead of myself. But these are the clinical notes and other things that we're wanting to pull data from and, and, and pull more rich context about what's happening with these patients. And that allows us to bring this important data forward into uh, the prediction modeling. This is my. Uh, this may be a bad diagram. I, I think that uh, when we submitted the grant initially, uh, the the um, NIH reviewers agreed this was not their favorite diagram, but I liked it, so I kept it. I, I keep it around for for fun. But this was the initial um, results that we had in pulling from the national data, which was informed by, you know, that that first initial study that we did with just the single center data. Now we're pulling um, patient records and clinical notes from multiple transplant centers in Florida and beginning to build this process out of having uh, social determinants of health and, and other ontologies that we're having, um, that we're training the machine to identify uh, uh, syntax and semantics and words and, and, and other pieces of rich uh, text data and then bring that forward into uh, a larger data set and database for eventual machine learning approaches and modeling. Our eventual goal through this, after we you know get all of this data into the modeling, is begin to devise and implement and hopefully build into the clinical process uh, support and and you know decision making support systems to allow this type of model to um, access real time data from transplant centers and offer good information and things to, to make decisions about within the clinical setting. 
I, I think it's it's so important to to have this information available uh, and, and made accessible to um, discuss with families and uh, on the patients importantly themselves. So this was our long-term goal to bring this information forward into understanding uh, how we can better predict and prepare patients and high-risk patients uh, to avoid um, hospitalization, rejection, and unfortunately mortality. Some of these psychosocial determinants of health that we're pulling from include easier things to, to get at, which is number and the, the you know, aspects of the home environment, but caregivers' uh, education level, uh, any type of psych psychosocial and um, socioeconomic indicators, um, presence of family conflict and their communication style in the family. This is going to be available in, in, within the social workers and psychologist notes. Why isn't this being pulled forward? We can talk about emotional support and readiness for the transplant, family support systems, their community supports, and um, presence of any type of mental health issues or concerns, everything from uh, other psychosocial concerns uh, as problems with housing, problems with divorce, involvement in child welfare services. But all of these different pieces are ones that we're beginning um, to build out and find either existing sort of data dictionaries that machine learning can get at within these text notes, or we're doing a small amount of annotation ourselves using uh, patient records from the University of Florida and Shands Children's Hospital there. That's our next step and hopefully pulling this information forward and, and having it supplement all of the important clinical work and clinical indicators that we have from, from either the patient record or from the UNIS data itself. So with that, um, we've started uh, a small group of us, uh, this initiative to advance pediatric transplant health research between Florida State University and the University of Florida. It includes uh, Dr. Tapankar Gupta, and I've mentioned him previously, an, uh, an important collaborator, Dr. Zha he, who's uh, one who's led up a lot of this um, uh, machine learning uh, and specific modeling. Uh, we have other um, pieces of this collaboration that we're working on, including um, you know, training of students and medical residents. Um, I have various um, uh, doctoral students uh, working on, on some of these projects, and we've also received other NIH funding uh, looking at trajectories over time of, medic of medication adherence among uh, pediatric patients, but also most recently working to um, uh, assess an intervention for its mobile health and, and um, a web, or sorry, an app-based um, mobile health application that would increase um, patient engagement, especially among teenagers in their medication adherence and provide inter interpersonal supports, uh, essentially through their cell phones, uh, see if we can't change and, um, and help foster improvement in their uh, medication adherence. So that's the, the structure of all of this. And, uh, and so I wanted to take any questions and also say thank you again for uh, you know, being invited to present to this group. I was surprised by the number of people when they told me about an hour ago that it was going to be upwards of you know, 50 or 150 people, somewhere in that range, and more people were going to see the recording of this. So that's pretty intimidating. <laughs> and, uh, but most importantly, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about this today. Thank you, Dr. Killian. This has been a great discussion and, and review of kind of the progress that you guys have made in, in this field and in looking at this in pediatric transplantation. You know, I think that the principles and limitations that you have outlined here expand beyond the pediatric realm and, and can be applied to all organs and all ages. And you know, I think in particular, when we think about patients who belong to vulnerable populations in our society, particularly our transplant patients, we've mm -hmm. always got to be mindful about the data that we're receiving and the potential biases there and how they can be perpetuated potentially through machine learning. You know, as you mentioned. Oh, you yeah, know. We, no, that's a great point. We, we, were, we were talking about um, you know, uh, race and ethnicity. Well, mm -hmm. actually, no, Dr. Spain, it was you and I was talking about this the other day. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry to everybody. Now I'm I'm talking about a separate conversation we had about this, but um, I the data is what the data is. Mm -hmm. um, now are there are there some biases or or some you know apprehensions? We certainly know that that there are race and 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 uh, and ethnic um, 
disparities throughout all of this. Is that inputted into the data by the people filling it out? Are they are they concerned? Are we taught to be concerned? Because it's so for any number of reasons. Um, I hope the data doesn't perpetuate, um, you know, uh, any type of, of of stereotype or bias. Um, it, it is something I'm worried about. Um, but also, I would hope then that we know if there are that this data does illuminate that if there are disparities, uh, we, we can see and find some ways to immediately address those and be mindful of those. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, when you look at the shop values, you know, things like the functional status make, make a lot of sense as to why someone will be re oh, yeah. But when, when it comes to things like race and ethnicity, is that really more so a surrogate for other social determinants of health that aren't being captured by the UNOS data? And, oh, and what can we sure. kind of do to get at that? Yeah, I and it's, it's yeah, I, I'm, oh, there are so many concerns there. We could do another hour or two on that alone. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, we've received quite a few different questions here. Um, a couple of them are more technical. Um, I did answer a couple already here in the chat, but uh, for a point of clarification, uh, did you utilize any gradient boosting approaches for the machine learning model development in the single center um, phase of the study? No, I think there the concern was running too many models with uh, too few data. I think we kept it simple as just a way to pilot this process initially and then move out from there. Um, and I guess another limitation with a single data, uh, a single study data is that we used multiple organ types. We didn't find any major differences or organ type being uh, an important predictor, um, but I wonder if that added to some of the inaccuracy within that data or within that modeling, sorry. Absolutely. Accuracy of the data is a whole nother issue. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Another question came through about utilizing 90 versus 10, 90 and 10 split for the training set versus 80 right. and 20. That's I, I I think we chose 90 and 10 just because it I think that's pretty standard. I see the question. Um let's see, complex clinical data outcome rejection. Um yeah, I see. I, I think we chose that just because it was it was deemed standard. I don't think there's a, we had a better reason than that. Um, I could ask Dr. Ha it, if eighty twenty would been would have been more appropriate, uh, and if we were here, I could ask him that. Absolutely. All Not right. I do see the other question there. That last one from um, Bo Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, in many machine learning applications, a good model does not approach eighty percent accuracy. Um, yeah, that was a question that was uh, with ISHLT as well uh, in cons uh, during the session was, uh, and it was one of the moderators asking every presenter, at what point is this good enough to act on? And, my, and I, I agree. And I my, so one of my major areas of research in terms of methodology is um, psychometric assessment and, and measurement development and validation. And I, I begin thinking about the degree of covariance and is this accurate enough or is, is there enough shared information? Is there enough covariation? And especially when we're looking at single individuals, it's easy to talk about this in a large population and think we got up to 80%. I do worry about achieving higher levels when we're trying to find it in one singular individual. Uh, that's a much more difficult game to play. Um, I, again, I would hope that you know, eighty percent we could exceed eighty uh, before we really start putting this into practice. And at that rate, then I hope you know we err on the side of caution and have any number of false positives where we mistakenly provide families with additional support uh, where it wasn't needed, as opposed to the other way around. Absolutely. A couple other questions about the temporal association of the data within the data set. Um, right. Did you guys consider kind of differences in policy changes over time and, and integrating that into the model in some way? Right. Yeah. And that's why I talked about the era effect um, and looking at year of transplant. Uh, and, and certainly those aren't, you know, that's just a sort of a proxy measure or something that's analogous to all of the various changes that have happened in terms of policy or, the, you know, recently we talked about the 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 changes in the um, listing status as, as now being different and the policies that have changed around that. Uh, instead of having those by era, uh, we included year of in, within the model as uh, an important covariate that was hopefully controlling for that type of um, issue. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think from a retrospective standpoint, that can be incredibly helpful to do is kind of to track it in that way. Once we get to a point where we might be able to think about doing some prospective evaluations, and I think that's really where using audit trails and monitoring for drift over time as policies change can really help in adjusting those models to help like, account for that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I'm reading here, uh, see, uh, James Perkins, the how are we building the, uh, the natural language processing modeling? carefully um and it it does and it we've we've used existing on on, on ontologies that we've uh, found and uh, sometimes we're, we're finding a lot more of these and ontologies are a large you know sort of the source of terms being coded one way or the other and uh and and sort of this on you know um natural language processing pipeline we have uh are, are developing uh, a lot of it goes um a, or a lot of it we pulled from, uh, um, adult populations because, you know, adult patients are now just the parents. So we're using a lot of those ontologies uh, to hopefully, in, you know, in help build out and code all of these other notes. The rest of this, we are going to have to sit down and annotate a number of things from the, the, the clinical notes. And, but we've, you know, we have a small pool of people that were, you know, that are between FSU and UF to hopefully you know, start that process. Um, I imagine I'll be spending quite a bit of my summer uh, digging through some clinical notes and annotating through one of the, the uh, I forget the software we have that helps with the annotation and showing, uh, you know, uh, the, and, and developing out more of this transplant and pediatric specific um, uh, language pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. I think that gets to one of the questions that I had for you is thinking about, you know, how can we make this more portable and scalable in the future, you know, thinking about data standards that may exist or may not exist currently that need to be created for social determinants of health so that we can better track those particular oh. items. Yeah, it's, you know, I, working with, um, we, we did a deep dive within UF uh, in Shan Children's Hospital and the Congenital Heart Center there. And I think this may have been also the same case at Dallas where there is a bit of a module about family history but it's so rarely used, if ever completed by anybody. So there is something that's an artifact of good intentions in the past that is has never been utilized uh, and that's just sort of sitting. It's an optional node or something or a data field that is structured data. But even then, I, I would imagine it would be largely incomplete for what we're talking about here. Um, within the clinical notes, and I've, I said this before, there's there's just a wealth of data uh, and important things, and I imagine a lot of a, a lot of transplant centers and, and transplant teams spend a lot of time talking to you know a small number of patients about these very issues, but they don't appear in any structured data fields. Uh, so that's that's our goals again to pull this forward and hopefully inform um, the modeling. What processes do you think need to be in place in order for us to be able to standardize kind of the collection of that data and, and map yeah. those potentially um, to new structured elements? Threat, uh, threatening people, I think that would work in completing, no. Um, no, it's hard because it, it's a lot of it. And this was a question, um, uh, Dr. Bukavelis, um, I, I've read a ton of your work. The I know he says much of the data in the EHR is subjective, and that's really challenging too. It's it's the the what's recorded is the current thoughts, beliefs, opinions, attitudes, informed uh, you know ideas about the patient by that person at that time. I, I wonder within the UNOS data too that uh, this is you know at the annual um, follow up form is completed by. Uh, somebody who's probably doing any number of these and recalling just the patient at the time and it's completed. So I imagine there's a lot of entry error or, or just, you know, um, poor recall uh, over the past, you know, 24 months of, or 12 months over one patient uh, done 20, 30 times in a sitting because the, those were, you know, those were needed to be done that day. Um, and you're getting one individual to fill out the forms based on the collective opinion or, you know, their opinion of the collective opinion of the team. So, no, I imagine a lot of the EHR, UNOS data is, is subjective. Um, and that's extremely difficult as well. 
Yeah. And particularly even for some of these, these outcomes, you know, hospitalization, hospitalizations are easy to say that, yes, they were hospitalized. No, they weren't hospitalized, but rejection and kind of more nuanced things about the yeah. completeness of that data can be at risk and potentially, um, you know, affect how the algorithms work as well, too. Yeah, Dr. Bukavelis also asked about the neighborhood deprivation index. That's a challenge, too. And there was a lot of presentations or a handful of, I should say not a lot, but a handful of presentations that looked at um, zip code and other things like that. Um, the problem there is still measurement error is I, I within one zip code, um, you know, one side of town, you know, may have the golf course and the other not. And so there's a lot of variation within um, within that type of data. And the neighborhood deprivation index, I, I know um, there was one presentation in particular uh, at this at the conference, uh, you know, it was just what a month or two ago, that looked at um, they essentially made the mistake of categorizing people as in high SES or low SES based on what neighborhood they lived in. And I said, no, this is this is more the family environment, but not necessarily the family themselves. And so there's there's a lot of measurement error within that. Um, and that's hard too. And getting down to you know census tract level data to really understand um, where the person's from and having that data linked, yeah, you know, it's a challenge too. Um, so yeah, there's there that's certainly a part of it. I, I mean, I hope there would be more accurate data as we go uh, about the you know community and the family environment. Yeah, absolutely. Can you speak a little bit to the computational intensive? of using NLP and and how we might be able to narrow that and, and be able to utilize that for other centers? Well, I, it, a lot of a lot of NLP is the, the automatic coding, you know, and training something to have higher levels of accuracy when taking apart text data. And that's the important tool that then gets into producing a final data set. And that's what we're, we're having plenty of challenges where, uh, with uh, with individual centers, because the access to notes, there's no way a privacy officer can go through and you know redact every important bit of every important note. Uh, and in some, uh, we've we've gotten pushback because they say, well, you can have patient data, but what if in the note we talk about a health concern of an uncle, in the, in the note, and then that brings up other ethical issues. And so we've had a, a lot of challenge implementing just the you know the infrastructure, getting the local support for looking at this and saying, okay, we'll give you the, we'll give you all the software to do it and all the programming to do it. Can you just return to us uh, a de-identified data set that only contains zeros and ones and dates of service, even date shifted dates of service about, um, you know, these patients and what was happening at certain days or, you know, amount of time post-transplant. Was there depression noted within six months, something, you know, something as basic as that is a real challenge to get to. Um, so the question then was about how to implement this further um, and other, yeah, it's it's the development in the implementation of that type of process and pipeline where it goes from text notes to what we call these things through and, you know, what, what they are listed as or not by identifying certain words and certain phrases. And is it put in the negative and, you know, in sem semantics? Um, or is it, as a sentence suggests, oh, these patients do have this, or no patient report or no family member reported difficulties with the following and having it know that that's the same sentence and now for those should all be coded differently. So that's a whole process uh, of coding out that data. Uh, and then after that, it hopefully we get it back as zeros and ones of something being present or absent at a time. And that's immediately brought forward into the other modeling process. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the absence of having those structured data elements within our UNOS yeah. data sets, we kind oh. of have to resort to these these techniques. But my question is, you know, in the setting that, you know, you and I talked about this previously, what if what we actually need is not documented within the note? How do we get at that information? And what are we missing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I have a lot of experience working in child welfare. Uh, and you find the same things in state databases uh, when you're looking at child welfare cases where the the social worker role or you know or supervisor will note plenty of things about the family being you know positive or can you know if you they sign off and then they'll speak uh, to a you know, case supervisor or other professional working on a case and say, wow, this is really wild or this family's done this or that. 
And sometimes what's documented isn't always an accurate reflection because of all the other pressures there are to report, uh, you know, sort of a mitigated amount of risk or, you know, or, or tamper down what's what's really concerning about, um, you know, a family. And I, I can see that similar pressure being here. Um, uh, Blanche, uh, you said, what are the, how are the risk factors for poor, poor adherence determined? I'm wondering if that was the, the question about adherence that was in the UNOS data. Um, that question was in the annual follow-up form that said, um, I forget the exact language, but something along the lines of, has the patient exhibited any behaviors of medication non-compliance that would hinder their recovery or something like that? I can't remember the exact question. But um, that was, I think, thrown out because uh, it began to be just the opinion, or someone argued that was the opinion of the transplant team in aggregate as reported by one person. And that was, you know, physician opinion is not a great metric for, um, you know, medication adherence or for measuring medication adherence. Yeah, it may not be, uh, but it was better than nothing. Um, so I, I, I hope that that was the, the question that was being asked. Um, there was somebody else anonymous. Did we look at the adult population? No, uh, no, that's not only has that been done a bit more, but, um, but no, there's, because there's so little done on in pediatrics, that's where our focus has been. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we've addressed a good bit of yeah. other questions. There was another question about looking at a more recent cohort as opposed to, um, the initial. Yeah. 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 Population. Yeah. Now on this initial study, um, there wasn't, we had to use all available data on that first one because it was just, you know, from a single center. We have talked about that, whether or not we include the year or we look at um, changes over time. We've certainly discussed it. Yeah. And looking at, you know, a more recent cohort and hopefully having a, enough available data in the last 10 years to, to do a sub-analysis, certainly. That's a great, it's a, it's a fair point. Some, I think something like that was done um, in one of the presentations that we just saw at ISHLT. Excellent. And, you know, we're getting close to time here. So my last question for you would be, how would you encourage people who are interested in kind of exploring these techniques locally? What steps should they take and what should you caution them about when they're looking at these particularly in our vulnerable populations? Oh, um, again, I, I'm trained mainly in, in biostatistics. So I'm used to general linear modeling, structural equation modeling, survival analysis, uh, let's see, latent mixture modeling, latent class analysis and latent profile analysis, maybe people have heard of. This is uh, machine learning is uh, again, looking at health informatics from a computer science statistical perspective. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to, to learn and to grow in this area only because I've had a good collaborator leading the way. Um, I don't think anybody can do this on their own uh, without significant help and support because my job has on these projects primarily has been to, to navigate the data extraction and to do that and modeling. Uh, for the, I mean, I've helped with the modeling, but for the most part, it's been Dr. Huzz, uh, been a, an, a, you know, an invaluable person on this. But together, he and I have been collaborating for years on various projects like this. Uh, and it goes, you need clinical experts to help with the interpretation, and we're going to need a lot more help when, when we go forward with hopefully implementing this in some way, because that's a whole nother animal, or not even that beast, I should say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for this yeah. discussion. It's been an excellent discussion and excellent Q&A session as well. And I would like to thank the organizers for coordinating this and, and Dr. Killian, you as well for this excellent discussion today. You know, yeah, I, I, you. Think, I think that the take home here is that machine learning modeling and artificial intelligence is not the solution to our bias problem. And we need to think of other ways in which we can address this, both from a policy level and making sure that we're actually getting the data that we need to address the problems that we want to answer and making sure that we think about alternative techniques like the natural language processing to be able to capture more data discreetly for evaluation and use. Yeah, perfect. Sure. I think any model that we develop can only be as good as the data that we give them. So we have to make sure that the data they receive are limited and biased from the beginning. It's always a challenge. Yeah. It is. It is. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That'll pass it back over to Brian to close.
Thank you so much. AST would like to thank Drs. Killian and Span, the leaders of PSC, COP, and PCOP, and all of our attendees for today's session. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey in Zoom and visit myast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for upcoming journal clubs. To learn more about AST's PSE, COP, and PCOP, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the individual COP hubs. Thank you all again for today's excellent session.